Um, I didn't really mean to name this talk what I named it because it comes across as a little preachy. <laughs> I meant to call it like three hidden treasures or three awesome things that will help you out. But in my mind, I was thinking um, these are things I know people aren't using, but they should be. So it's a little judgy, and I, I apologize for that. Um, so what I'm going to try to do is cajole you into uh, using these features by showing you how I think they're awesome, and then maybe you might agree with me and you might try that out, try that out on your own later. And I, if I get too preachy, I'm sorry. It's just my upbringing and can't help it. So the first feature I'm going to show you was introduced way back in the year 2007. And the other features I'm going to show you have been out uh, at least since that time, um, or at least in the last five years. So uh, not a lot of leading edge new stuff I'm going to show. There's one or two exceptions. And I really do think if you take the time to invest in these things, the payoff will totally be worth it and then some. Uh, I'm a productivity freak. Like what personally um, satisfies me is when I can help someone with a question and then it makes their day a little bit better. So that, that's what I want to do here today. By the way, the slides I uploaded are completely wrong because I built the slide deck last week. So don't download the slides for this talk until probably next week. But I'll have these up on SlideShare, um, which is a social media website for PowerPoints <laughs> uh, later today. So the first thing I want to talk to you about is reports. Who in here is actually using reports today? Oh, a good few of you. Who would like to do this section of the talk? <laughs> um, what these reports are not. Um, they're not designed for end users. They're not, um, they're not like in the same sense of a report as what you would build an interactive report in Apex. These are more of an ad hoc report for the SQL developer user themselves. Um, we hide it in plain sight in the tool. It's uh, right up there in the top corner. It's a panel, although you can move that, close it, float it, hide it. If you can't find it, it's on the view menu. If you still can't find it, you can go to the window menu and there's an item on here that says reset windows to factory settings. That's not talking about the operating system, it's talking about the windowing system in the tool. That sometimes will help you get those windows back. And when I think about reports, it's usually when I've decided or realized I've ran the same query more than once. And I don't ever want to have to look for that query again or remember exactly how I typed it the first time. And I want it to be just accessible to me very, very quickly. And I might want to do something fancy with the output. That's when I get drawn to reports. Um, the example that I always use is there's Bob in accounting who emails you every Monday wanting those numbers. And if you're pulling up a script or a query out of your history, you might want to consider formalizing that as, a, as an actual report. Because you can parameterize it, you can get the output just the way that you want, they're very easy to share, you can add graphs and charts, um, and it's going to let you make Bob happier faster. So that's what I'm going to spend the next couple minutes showing you how to, how to do. So all a report is, it's a, it's a type of editor in the tool. And behind it is at least one query that's going to, or a, or a PL SQL block. And the data by default will come back and be displayed in a grid, just like you would run a query in a worksheet. This is the most boring type of report. Um, so up top we have, uh, you can think of it as like a parent report. And as I click on an item up top, it fires off a query on the bottom based on a bind variable from the top. So I can click on 
my album, Appetite for Destruction, on the bottom, it's going to query all the songs on that album. So I just see those records. So for those of you using reports, have you all managed to figure out how to do parent-child reports? For those of you who have not, we'll get to that in a second. So to, to build a report, um, actually what I'm going to show you is how to define the report, um, show you how the grids work, how to do prompts so they can be interactive per se, uh, and then how to get them out to HTML or PDF if you'd like and how so you can command, call it from the command line if you, if you want to do that as well. So before you have to write any of your own reports, we do ship with a ton of reports. What most people don't realize is that if you don't like our report, you can change them and make them do anything that you want. So let me show you what I mean by that. Many folks do not, well, they, they like the monitor sessions page, but they might have one or two things they'd like to change about it. And while this is a screen in the UI, it's also a report that we ship uh, in the, in the um, default reports. And it's on the sessions category. And I think it's, I think it might be this one. Yeah, so that looks pretty much the same as that, as that other page we were seeing. So if I right click and say copy, and then come down here to user defined reports, I've already done this, but maybe I'll delete this. Oops. So now I'm going to right click and say paste. And this will take a second, but that report will show up here on the tree, and then I can go change with it and play with it. Maybe I should have closed my email before I uh, did this talk. Did I not do it right? Copy and paste. There it is. So now I can open up the editor, and I can change the query up the top, or any of these on the bottom. Um, and sometimes what I will do is where it goes to get the plan, or actually not the plan, but the, um, the SQL text itself. Sometimes I'll change this to say if the value from <coughs> GV SQL is null, like there's actually not the current query running. Sometimes I'll change that with to get the previous SQL, so I can always at least see what the last query was instead of not the current one. But now that it's down here in the user defined report section, I can do anything with this that I that I want. So if you find one of these reports up top that you're fond of and you want to steal it for yourself, it's just a simple matter of copying and pasting it down to the, the user defined section. Okay, so the reports that you're going to write, you can basically get anything out that you want. Um, any sort of valid query statement will work. I generally write those in the worksheet and get it right first before I start typing it in here because um, you have to save the report and run it to see if it's going to work. Um, so I, I do all of that in, in the worksheet. Uh, okay, so the parent and child binding, the trick, there's not really a trick, but what you have to do is, so in the uh, top query, I might have um, a department number or ID or name uh, in the result set, and when I click on a row, I might want to have a query on the bottom, say, you know, well, get me everything you know about that department. And the way you reference that value is like using a bind style notation, so, you know, uh, colon, uh, the uh, column name, and the, the only tricky part is you want to make sure it's uppercase. So let's just, let's just build one of these from scratch. OK, 
Okay, scope, parent, child. So up top, I'm going to say select star from, I don't know, I should have thought about this in advance, huh? Select star from uh, departments. So you can kind of check these as you go. So that's going to work. So we'll do apply. And now that report's defined on the left. So I'm going to edit. And we're going to add a child report. And we'll call this um, depth info. And expand this and go to this report. Actually, I, I did it backwards, didn't I? So we'll just do select star from employees or department ID equals. And we'll see how that goes. There we go. So I don't have anyone in my blogging department or video production or social media, but I do have a lot of people in purchasing and human resources. Yep. So again, the trick, not a trick, it is a documented feature. You just make sure you reference the column down here in the driving part of the report as uppercase in the child. That was a horrible drawing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm used to having a mouse that I could not T-Rex form. No. Nine times out of 10 when I can't get a report to work, it's because I forgot to uppercase the, the driving value. Now you can have as many child tables as you want down on the bottom, okay? Uh, they are supposed to run uh, as you click on the top and then as you open them. So you won't have 50 of them run all at once as you click on one. You should just have the one run. Other tricks, in case you weren't here yesterday, these aren't the default um, fonts and grid stylings in the tool. I've enabled um, these grids to display with these alternating color schemes. I think it's just easier on the eyes, and I've used a font that's pleasing to our eyes because you guys are sitting way back there and you're not up here. Visual aids. So you can do a lot of fancy stuff to make these reports look really ugly. <laughs> um, so we've got a custom name and different fonts and colors in the titles, different uh, fonts in the labels. I've got like a 3D graph going and then behind it I've got like this little uh, grid pattern that's supposed to do something. You, you can go crazy on the properties on the charts if you want. So just don't think that the, the default chart is all you've got. The, this other stuff's just actually just a right click away or so. Um, so what I have on top is a, a, a report. And as I click on one of those chart elements, it takes the value for that and, and populates the bottom. So you don't have to do, you know, plain grid up top and plain grid on the bottom. You can do chart, chart. Chart, grid, grid, chart, however, whichever combination you want to go. So uh, three or four years ago, we updated the charting library in the tool, and we've added a whole bunch of those for version 4.0. So you need version 4.0 or higher. Um, if you're on an older version, I think there's like four styles that you can choose from. I'm not going to demo these. That's why I made this animated GIF. And I'm not going to make you sit through all of them. The uh, nice thing about the charts and graphs is you can visualize them as you're building them. To make sure you're getting it defined correctly. So if we go look at a chart, let's see if I've got one. Time of day for beers. So these would be the number of beers and what time it is. I don't know. I write these things for demos. I don't write them for real world. OK. 
case scenarios. So this is a style chart report on the property up on the right hand side. This is also done in 4.0. So you can actually define a connection in design time and have the chart render as you make changes to it. So you don't have to click save, come out, rerun the report, and then try it again. You can be much more iterative right here in the, um, in the design page. And you can do this here too. So I can say use live data. And as I come down here and set the group series and value, I can see how that's affecting what's going to pop out. So if you've got a report that takes 10 minutes to run, don't use the live data feature. Maybe I have a better. Yeah, top chart, top beers by year. So in 2016, the beer that I like the most was something out of Charlotte called Hop, Drop, and Roll, which is an IPA in case you're interested. I don't um, have a spreadsheet for the beers that I drink. I use a social media app called Untapped. So I have a problem, but it's not you know that bad of a problem that I would go to Excel for. It's on my phone, so I have to have to play with it. Yeah. So um, her question, Helen's question in the back was, is there a way to export this out? And um, maybe I'll get brave and try that. <clears throat> now I have to remember how to do it. This always takes me a second to remember. HTML. We're going to call it the Helen report. Well, I'll always remember that time we had in San Antonio. I'm on the HR. Just in case. Apply. And as I click on these, we should see the data on the bottom. So what does this tell you about what you shouldn't do? Not good for bajillion row reports. Unless you've got a really nice computer, perhaps. Um, the first time I tried this, I actually wasn't expecting it to be this nice or for it to actually work. So I was, I was happy when it did. Uh, I don't like showing this too much because really, if this was going to be made for a real business application, you should be doing it in Application Express. So you can have security and you can have data integrity and it can be live data and then the user can make changes to this stuff and all of that. But if you're really fond of this report and you want to send it to someone, Yes, you can right-click and say HTML, and it'll come out. Does that answer your question, Helen? Because this, this session's all for you. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, you can also prompt users for, uh, for inputs. So I don't want to select star from without a predicate. You can add those. Uh, as binds in your uh, top drive and query and before the report runs it's going to ask you for those values and we'll even remember the values that you've submitted so you can reuse them next time if you like uh, and you can and you can supply defaults so they can just hit enter if they're lazy like me and you can also also add a tooltip to tell them basically here's what here's what I'm looking for so we could say Um, please don't ever use my SQL. Isn't that no. I could also say this is really not good SQL. I know. That's not going to work. Uh, let's do a different report. Yeah, here's one actually built in. Yay. So there's a prompt here for owner in the table name. So we can leave these as null or I could say just demo. 
then it's updated that query to just get through that information. Okay, so this is um, a bit of advanced wizardry. I have uh, my beer table, and maybe I want to not only just browse the data, I want to make changes to a table based on the data I'm looking at. So I coded a context menu called, yes, I have visited this brewery. So I can right click on the report and say visited, and it automatically updates a table um, based on values I have in that row. So this is not surfaceable in the, the design, the, the report designer itself. But if you save, um, if you get into the XML behind the report, you can use our documented uh, bits there to code in um, the prompts and the, the work that's going to go on the database connection. And I have this example um, on my blog. So if you're lazy, and it's not just browsing data, but maybe you want to do data cleanup or something else, um, this is an, a nice trick, I think. Um, so I showed you parent-child reports. Maybe you want grandparent-parent-child reports. Uh, again, you can do that, uh, but not via the UI itself, but you can do it by tricking it in the XML. And if you open up the XML, um, you can add as many levels as you want. So I get this request every now and then, and I have the how to do that with the sample report on my website as well, which is thatjeffsmith.com, just in case you didn't know. Now, there are some really nice reports that you can generate. This is a SQL developer report, um, and it's showing, uh, I think it's showing archive log, by hours of the day and days in the month. So the redder the box, the more archive logs were generated. So it's something really interesting happened on July 17th, 2012 at four in the morning, it looks like. Um, this report is on uh, Stack Overflow and a nice community member uh, has shared a few of those there. So if you just Google um, HTML reports SQL developer uh, heat map, you'll find examples of these reports. And he's using SQL developer, if I remember this correctly, to run some DBMS output um, code to generate JavaScript, which then gets rendered uh, in our browser because we support HTML3. So it's not fancy HTML5 stuff, but you know it can serve a nice purpose, I think. I'll show you a real practical re report that I wrote for myself. Um, SQL Developer has an interface to the tuning advisor for ad hoc queries in a worksheet. But the tuning advisor also uh, automatically does tuning tasks based on what it sees going on in the database. And we don't have an interface to that, so I just kind of made a stupid one. Um, it's a report, it's called Automatic Tuning Advisor. And if we can see one in here that might be interesting. I click on it and then it just prints for me the report below? That one's not interesting. That one looks interesting. So this is exactly what you would see in Enterprise Manager. And again, I'm just lazy. I don't want to have to write that stuff. So what I have in my child report is a, a slightly different style report. It's not the grid. It's a it's a uh, PL SQL DBMS output style report. So I, I just declare a clob because that's how the data is stored for those tuning advisor tasks. And I feed it the task name from that top part of the grid. 
and I select the data into that glob, and then I use dbms output to print it. And then it shows up down here. Uh, you could use uh, HTML tags if you want uh, to really print anything down there you want, as long as they're in that very basic HTML3 library. So pretend you're in uh, Netscape in 1997 <laughs> reports. Again, fancy, cool end user stuff. That's Application Express. Lazy dev, hacky stuff, SQL dev works, works great. So um, you can share a report, you can share a collection of reports, and it's, it's so easy, it's almost not intuitive, it's how easy it is. Uh, if I right click on a folder and say save as, it goes to an XML file, I email that to my coworker Ashley, Ashley opens up SQL Developer, she says um, import or open, or she right clicks and says open, points to that XML file, and it has this folder and all of the reports in it. Now, if you just right click on one report and do that, you'll just get the one report. So very, very easy to share reports. So if one of you wants to be nice for your entire department, then, you know, maybe that's your ticket to K-Scope 18, maybe. Or maybe it's your ticket to like an extra value meal at McDonald's or something. I don't know. Get something out of doing nice things for others. So uh, we have two command line interfaces for SQL Developer. There's SQL CL, which is the interactive SQL Plus style thing. And then we also have one called uh, SD CLI, um, which allows you to fire off the entire SQL Developer product um, behind the, the, the UI, but it can do work like generate reports and export them to HTML. Uh, so if you needed to generate a report every night and you were too lazy to do Apex, I guess you could use this. Um, this command line interface is also useful for um, executing off unit tests that you've defined. And then you could plug that into your automated build processes. Uh, you can use this to do database exports, and you can use it to do um, other things like formatting files with the formatter and, and, that, and that sort of thing. But if you just do SDCLI help, it'll, it'll print for you what's available and, and how to call this stuff. Any, any questions on reports? How am I doing on time, Helen? So I have half an hour left? Okay, I've never done this talk before, so my pacing is just as we go loosey-goosey. Um, who in here is aware of PL scope? Oh good, more than maybe, maybe almost half. So this is not a SQL developer feature, this is a database feature. For those of you that are aware of it, who of you are actually using it? And you're using it in SQL Developer. You two are, because you're geeks. <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll show you how to use it too, and I think you'll find it quite useful. And it's a way for me to suck up the brand, but he's not even in here, so. Oh well. So. Who in here has ever uh, written something like uh, select star from all source where text like regular expression blah, and you're looking for stuff in your PL SQL code, right? Is that super fast? No, it's not really fast at all. And uh, it's, it's hard to look for certain things. Like maybe uh, you've got a cursor and you're wondering where you're using that cursor, where it's defined, where it's being invoked, where it's, stuff, where it's being assigned and, and that sort of thing. So automagically, when you compile your PL SQL, if you have PL scope enabled, it, the database automatically tracks all that stuff in a separate data dictionary view. Much better level of granularity, doesn't have the actual code in it, so very, very, very fast. And um, we give you access to this data um, in the tool. So it, it, we don't decorate the code editor itself with this information. I'm thinking about maybe doing that to suck up to Bryn a little bit more. Um, so if you think that would be interesting, let me know and we'll think about it. What we do do today, though, is we allow you to search it via the, the search feature. So who here knows and uses the search feature in SQL Developer? Yeah, not enough of you. I guess I could have made this feature number three that you should be using, but I didn't. Uh, 
guess that was the right one. Oh yeah, it is the right one. I noticed a lot of people were not using this feature, so we did a very rare thing. We added a button to the toolbar. We pride ourselves on Spartan toolbars. <laughs> we try not to have 30,000 buttons on them, but we did add a button. So the binoculars button will open the Find Database Object panel. And since it's a panel, it's also available in the View menu. Okay? And then once it's open, you can search all the usual suspects. You know, find me tables named this, find me columns named that. Uh, let me search the PL SQL source code. And uh, you can say search all schemas, search one schema. Um, if you're doing uh, object name searches, you can say search all object types or just tables, views, synonyms, procedures. And what's been in there for a very long time is we've had all identifier types and all identifier usages. So this is the scope. This is the PL scope data. Um, something we added for 17.2, which will be available soon. I don't know how soon. Soonish, okay, says Ashley. Um, you can now also search the uh, code handlers in your RESTful services. You just check words under the code box. And for 4.2, we added the ability to search your view source, which is you know, the SQL behind your views. Didn't have that in there before. So a lot of powerful stuff in here, but what I'm gonna show you is the identifiers. So identifier types, tons of things in here. But these are all of the things in your PL SQL code you might be interested in. Ref cursors, uh, records, exceptions. Uh, what else do we have? Opaques, variables, V arrays. So, and then not only searching for things of that type, you can also search for where they're being assigned, called, declared, defined, and referenced. So I uh, searched both, and I'm a really bad coder, and I call my cursor C. I should call them C1, that would be better. Um, and then when you do that search, yes, that was a joke, thank you for kind of chuckling. Um, here are my search results. And you can see I searched across, it looks like all of my schemas. But if you don't want to, you can uncheck this and just search, you know, the seven schemas that you care about. And of course, I didn't have to search all of my identifier types. I know exactly what I was looking for. I could have just searched this. And then here are my hits. I'm not going to show that one. So I've got this C object declared in line four, column three. It's called in the same program right after that, and it's referenced um, it's right after that. And uh, this get beers function, and then also this ref cursor function. Now, this is a browser in, in a sort, in a way. So if I click on this, what it's supposed to do is take me, well, what it's supposed to do, it's supposed to put the cursor yeah, it did in that point. It's supposed to take the cursor right here to where that's being used or called. Does this look useful at all? Now, um, who in here is on 12C for anything, especially development? Oh, a lot of you. Awesome. I'm going to get that nice fat bonus this summer, it looks like. Get that pool put in. Uh, who in here is on 12C release 2 or is at least thinking about it? Yeah? Oh, thinking about it, a lot of you. Um, think about it real hard, because I want that pool. No. I have zero uh, monetary in that game. So in 12.2, the PL SQL team enhanced PL scope to not only track this stuff, but also to track SQL statements. So static SQL in your PL SQL. Someone wrote a select star from. You found it in one procedure. Where else is it? Well, this, this feature tracks that in the data dictionary now. So if you're on 12.2, you would be able to search that. Uh, we haven't enhanced the UI to take advantage of that yet. But you can create a report 
to go get that. It's a, it's, um, there's a new data, a new data dictionary view called, I think, all statements. I'm gonna have a blog post on this on how to do it. I'm actually not running my 12.2 image right now, which is very bad PM. I'm on 12.1. But if we look at the, um, if we look at the data behind it, you'll see how easy it is to go get it. Yeah, it's all statements, or of course user statements, or of course DBA statements. I have a blog post on that, so we can cheat, show it to you that way. Yeah, that's what this report looks like. So I'm saying um, it's it's going to prompt for a string, and then I look for that query text, and then it pulls back, and you can see um, where it's being used. And then I've also built the object navigators to take me to those those code objects. And I've got this report. Oh, you're looking at it right here. You can steal that one if you want. This one's probably good enough to steal. Um, and if you want to go play with 12C Release 2, we have a VirtualBox image on the Oracle Technology Network that's completely free to use for educational purposes. And if you're a control freak and you want to build your own and you're lazy, we just open sourced our scripts that we use to build those images yourself. So you can customize and put anything down on it you want, take anything off that you want. I think all you have to do is download the ISO Oracle Linux, and you also have to download the um, Oracle Linux database 12CR2 media, and then you have, we give you everything else you need. You just put that in an expected directory, run the script, and like, uh, is it, does it take an hour to run? Actually? Minutes later, out pops out a fully formed Oracle VirtualBox appliance. So. If you don't want to go into the Docker and you want to stay in the VBox world and you want to be able to build and stand up test uh, things, we've been putting these out for years. And so we've decided let's just open source how we do that and let you folks build your own if you want. Oh, let me show you how to turn that on. So to get the compiler to collect the scope, what you'll want to do is on database, PL SQL compiler, scope identifiers, switch that from none to all. There is a third level that they added for 12C R2. Can't remember what that, what that one does. So uh, probably a wee tiny bit of overhead, but I think totally worth price. You could write a, um, a trigger or a login um, script to turn those on and off based on the database you're working with if you wanted to. Oh, and here's the um, official description of the statements. So static SQL and PL SQL units. What you want to know about the SQL ID, the statement text, the statement type, where it's being used, its signature and location in your code. You guys all write dynamic SQL though, right? You never put select star from it. You would never use this feature, right? I would use it all the time. I should, I should have just advanced the slides faster. I wouldn't have to do that awkward demo. Oh well. So um, I said three things, but I actually figured I'd show maybe five things. But we'll do these much quicker than the, than the first two, if that's OK. Um, I had visited my dad in his office for a really long time. I lived in my dad's office basically for all of junior high, because I could walk right out of school to where he worked and hang out with him so he could take me home. Um, and he taught me computers. You know, so I was like, yeah, cool dude. And I walk in like two years ago and his desktop looks like this. And just, I just almost kind of died. But I've seen power SQL developer users this week doing demos and their connections in the panel look like this too. Um, we have this feature called folders. <laughs> so, um, 
You can just right click on one or more connections and say add to an existing folder or create a new one. And they're quite nice. Uh, what they don't do, we don't support subfolders yet. I'm, who, who would like the ability to even subfolderize column? They want subfolders. So when I go yell at John, you can just back me up and say, yes, yes, Jeff, they wanted subfolders. Yeah? So just nod your head. Um, and then uh, what we also don't do is the connection selectors off like the worksheet don't have the folder structures in them. So um, the developers kind of told me he'll try to work on that for the next release for you folks. Yep. Um, another trick, um, if you want to move machines, you can right click on your connections and say export and you can also password protect those and then open them up on your other machine and the structure folders, the connection details, and the passwords, if you want them, will all come over to your new machine. So that's a useful trick. OK. Um, so we really want to open source as much stuff as we can, including maybe products. So Oracle SQL CL we're talking about open sourcing. I don't think we're going to be able to open source uh, SQL Developer, but um, we have put out on GitHub, and this is available right now, kind of an SDK of sorts on how to build your own extensions to the tool. Uh, and we have two types of extensions. They have XML extensions, which means, yeah, you can just plug into an existing framework and use XML to define widgets in the screens. Um, and then also since SQL Developer is a Java application, you can do custom Java extensions, which gives you a lot more power and control over how to make things work. Um, so here's an example of an extension where you can add your own things to the tree, things that we haven't thought of. And then all of that stuff that you learned about reports, those get added over here as the editors that you could see when you click on these things. So you guys are smarter than us as a, as a collective whole, I think. If we're missing something here, um, add it. Like if you want a project-based way of viewing stuff, where you could add any object type to it, you could theoretically do that with this, open, with this GitHub uh, examples. If you just uh, Google Oracle SQL Developer GitHub examples, it should take you right there. And when I upload my slide deck, I've got the link in there to it. Uh, we also, uh, so this is XML based. The way we control what's on the tree and all these editors over here, those are all XML files that control how that works. Um, this one is a Java um, extension that we've put out as a demonstration. So this uses Java FX. It reads the information in the dependencies views and then draws them so you can see, um, in this case, what employees looks like in terms of data dictionary dependencies. So if that looks interesting to you, it might be worth the time to just download the code and plug it in. Code templates. How much time do I have? 15 more minutes left? We have to do some more, more hidden things you're not using enough of. So maybe I'll spend a good time, a good amount of time doing this. Who knows about the code templates and who's using them? A few of you. Good. That makes me happy. Um, I'm gonna be even happier when the rest of you start using these. So uh, lazy coders write code that write code for them, right? So that's what this is. Frequently bits of code that you want to insert to a worksheet or a code editor, and you can call them by name. So I've got one here called SSF2, select star from 2, and it puts this code in a worksheet. It worked two seconds ago, so hopefully it still works. Yep. I should be able to type right over that. Yep. So it puts the cursor right where I want it. And I can just type and go right away. So uh, I only have room in my brain for about six of these. You probably have more room than me. You can add as many as you want. 
go to the preferences. Is it code? I think it's not code editor. For some reason, it's under database. Code templates. Yep. So here's a list. Give it the ID. Type the ID. Um, control space bar will replace that with what's over here on the right. And to do the cursor trick, use this um, bracket to outline what you want to have selected after that text goes in. And then since it's selected, as you start typing, it'll just, it'll just replace that. Now, some people told me that the control space is too hard. They want auto replace. So if you want auto replace, just check the auto replace box. So as soon as you hit a space or a carriage return after typing this code, it will auto replace uh, that text with what you have on the right. The auto replace trick loses that cool selected text thing I just showed you. So pick the one that you're going to use the most. If you're always typing form instead of from, that might be an example of the auto replace. Do I have more slides after this? Oh yeah, and here's just a here's a trick if you're gonna do live demo, record it too, so you can just rely on the recording in case your computer looks up. So we can end or we could uh, do QA or I could show you more stuff that you should be using. More stuff? Greedy people. Man. <laughs> See if I can find some cool pictures to show them. Okay. Man, some people don't realize this. When you're looking with um, PL SQL, if, you ha if you're hiding your tree, which I do usually because I want as much room on the uh, screen as possible for just my code. So I'll, I'll hide this. So I kind of lose my navigator here for my code. You can just right click in the code space and ask for the outline and you get it back. So we recently enhanced this. There's like a power version of this where you can go really into the minutia, the details of the code. But then we also have the old school one left, and if I click on this, it'll take me to that code on the right, and you can also search that. And we've also made it so as you click on stuff on the right, it'll update where you're at on the left, too. Um, that's kind of a work in progress. You can take a screenshot. Um, I think the answer to your question is no, you can't. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know of a way to turn that into a report. Although the guy that wrote this would love that feedback and he'd love to build a report, especially the one based on the parse tree. Let's say you want to have your cake and eat it too. You love all these panels. You love all these advanced features. And you can put these anywhere you want. Come on. There we go. But now I'm ready to code, and all of a sudden I can't code anymore. It's going to take me 10 seconds to go and declickerize all those panels. If I just double click the editor, it takes me to full page code mode. And double click again, and uh, it's back. Ooh, ah, I know. I went to Texas, and this is the best thing I learned. No. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see, what else do we have in here? Look. Oh, SQL history. Another one of those panels. F8. We'll bring it up.
So we save the 100 by default. I recommend you go into preferences and bump that way up. And we remember your queries and your scripts that you've executed. We remember how many times they've executed. And we also take a collection of the total time spent executing them. And we show you the database you last executed it on. Probably we're able to figure out all of that for yourself by looking at the screen. Um, some things that you might not have thought of. Um, these are all the queries I've ever written across all the time. And if I just go browsing through them, that's not very useful. But let's say I'm working on a payroll app today, and I only want to see the queries from that module. I've got a table in there called imp that auto filters those queries down. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to hide that panel again because I, I, I want full code, full code mode. And uh, now as I use the keyboard to cycle through that list, I'm only seeing my HR bits. So I, I think that could be a, a, a little hack that you could take advantage of. You just got to remember, oh, no, I lost that query. Oh, do you have a filter? Do you have a filter on? The keyboard shortcuts control up or down. And if you accidentally clobber your code with that, don't get mad. Just undo. Control Z will we'll undo that. And uh, if you can't train your fingers to not do that or to do that, you can go into the preferences and change any of the keyboard shortcuts that you want, in including control up, down. On a Mac, it's command up, down. Thanks for the assist, Helen. SQL CL has this feature too. Instead of control up or down, you use the down or up arrow key. And the equivalent of... Um, F8 is just a command called history, which shows, shows all these queries, and you can pull those up too. So I could pull up um, number 237. I've asked for a search feature on this. Um, so I want to change that. So that's the history feature in the command line. Seven more minutes. Was everyone here for my talk yesterday? Because I, I, I you, you weren't. So should I showed you the most important tip and trick I showed yesterday, just in case? Um, Maria said she liked this the best. So in honor of Maria, SQL Maria. Uh, Right click on a tab and say new document tab group, and then you're going to be able to work with multiple things concurrently on the screen. So I could have uh, a code object over here, and over here I could have my worksheet, or I could have another code object, or I could add a table, or, or, or whatever I want. Um, and when dealing with code, I can also split the editor, so I can deal with multi uh, different parts of the code all in one editor. Don't ever start up two copies of SQL Dev just so you can do two things at once. The, these editors support all of that stuff out of the box. You all oh, you want to show copy and paste trick? Yeah. That's why she's an Oracle ace. Oh, you want just the, um, like that? Yeah, they're, they're comma separated. Yay. Ooh, ah. <laughs> now. <laughs> Sabine's not lazy, and she's not a bad typer, but I am both. So I had them do something similar to that. I want column names out of this grid, but I only want the column names. So select values out of the columns that you want, and then right-click on the column header and say copy selected column headers, and then paste that, and you've got that. Ooh. <laughs> This one gets people all the time, and I don't know how to make it better. So I'll, I'm open for suggestions. How do you copy the data out of a grid and get the column headers? Does anyone know how to do that other than Sabine? 
So control C grabs the data, right? Control shift C grabs the data and the column headers. I don't know how to make that more available to users. I think it's in the keyboard shortcuts preferences. Uh, otherwise, I'll just continue enjoying the traffic on my blog as people get pissed off in Google. How do I get the column headers? <laughs> So I want to thank everyone for the time. It feels like I've done every session here. You had to listen to me for like hours on Sunday. They were very generous and gave me two talks during the week. We helped out with the hands-on labs. And I haven't spent too much time at the booth, but I'm going to try to spend the rest of the day down at the booth in the exhibition hall. Thanks for always putting a smile on my face. Thanks for being great customers. Um, I'll be here today and tonight at the uh, uh, thank you party. So if you want to have another discussion on any of this, please feel free to walk up and we'll, we'll do our best to help. Thanks. <laughs>